This is a presentation for the Humanitarian Logistics Association um, that I was asked to do, giving a little bit of an introduction on how humanitarian logistics is being affected by this change towards cash transfer programming. Um, the objective of this session is to provide a little bit of insight in how cash is really affecting supply chain's role um, and supply chain's responsibilities and what we need to do as supply chain logistics professionals to get up to speed and be ready to handle it. Um, this is not designed to be an instructional session, um, but you know, it, this is not a course, but hopefully we'll provide some insight and help you understand where you can go to get additional information. So let's start with some basics. Let's talk about what is a modality. Um, this is the basic definition from um, CALP, the Cash Learning Partnership. Modality means transfer. It's a form of transfer. It's how you're getting the aid to a beneficiary. There are three major forms of um, modalities. There's cash, vouchers, in-kind. Interestingly, cash has actually been noted as in use for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's evidence of it going back to the 1200s. Um, and there's reports of the American Red Cross using it in the 1900s. Um, so it's been used for a very long time. In the humanitarian sector though, as we know it, it really started being tested around 2004 after, um, and 2005, um, especially after the tsunami in Indonesia. Um, but it's really become this gigantic shift in the last decade. I know WFP went from uh, about $40 million in cash transfers in 2009 to about 900 million in 2014. That's approximately a quarter of their equivalent of their procurement portfolio of the amount of food that they would be giving. And that's a huge, huge shift for this sector. And why is this happening? Um, these benefits of cash come from um, a high level panel on cash transfers that was put together to really advise the overall um, UN Secretary General as well as the humanitarian community on why they might want to use cash. It aligns the system better with what people need. Um, it helps increase transparency. It helps increase accountability. Um, it even provides the affected populations with more choice and control over their own lives. But one of the most important ones that we're gonna be talking about is the fact that the use of cash, this number five up here in the upper right hand corner, it supports local markets, jobs, local producers as well. So the, a program's objectives might be to, primary objective might be to feed refugees. A secondary objective might be to support the local host economy. <clears throat> and while the, these secondary objectives are enough to influence the way or the choices, the choice of the modality. Um, and a lot of times these days you'll have donors asking or people asking why not cash? Because cash would support better this local host economy. So why not use it? Now, modalities, 
that we talk about when we talk about cash transfer programming um, actually include both cash and vouchers, really. So there's two. Um, and those can really be broken down into sort of submodalities of direct or physical cash versus electronic. And then you have a paper voucher or a physical voucher versus an electronic one. So there's further sort of subcategories of physical versus electronic. This framework, by the way, is the way kelp defines and present, presents modalities. Now, another term you might hear regularly is mechanism. What is a delivery mechanism? It is a means or a tool for doing or conveying that modality. It is, the mechanism would be your mobile money. It would be the actual check. It would be your ATM card. Um, <clears throat> your modality might be direct cash, um, cash and envelopes. The mechanism then would be the envelope in the process of distributing those envelopes. Um, your modality might be electronic cash and your mechanism would be the mobile money service that you're using to deliver that. <clears throat> Sorry, Maggie, you said you wanted to know number six. Um, increased support from humanitarian aid to local populations. Um, I'd have to actually go back and look at the details of this report. Um, this is, the report is called Doing Cash Differently, a report on the high level plan panel. Um, I understand why you're asking. I just don't have the specifics in front of me at this point. Um, but I tell you what, what I'll do is I'll make sure a link is included with the follow-up notes um, or at the chat window at the end so that you can find the report. Does that work? So delivery mechanisms. So if we take those four categories of electronic and sort of physical, and cash versus vouchers and break them down, what you can get or what you get are a bunch, whole bunch of different types of mechanisms that can be used to deliver cash and vouchers. So what does this mean for us in supply chain logistics? This is the process or a very simplified version of a supply chain delivery process for aid. It starts with procurement. You know, so you're told, okay, we're gonna support these beneficiaries and we wanna give them say, you know, there's 150 beneficiaries, we want to give them 150 blankets. And so we're informed, we go out and we buy the blankets, we may ship them, we may warehouse them or store them, receive them, and then we'll distribute them. And like I said, this is an oversimplified supply chain. Now what we get when we have cash, instead is you might be Instead of buying blankets, you might be contracting with a bank, a service provider to transfer the money. You'll be running an encashment process. And in the end, you'd be giving the beneficiaries something such as a debit card. So, what does this mean in terms of differences? Well, delivery 
if you're doing the in-kind, the physical blankets, you're doing the delivery yourself as a humanitarian organization. If you're using cash transfer programming, that delivery is now really being done by the private sector because what you've done is you've contracted with that service provider to provide the money it would cost to buy a blanket. They're getting the money to the beneficiary and then the beneficiary can go to the sector or go to a shop and buy a blanket with money. And how that blanket gets to the beneficiary is they are, the private sector is either making or purchasing the blanket, delivering it to the shops and making it available to the beneficiaries. So payment for this delivery or the money, um, if you're doing in kind, all the money that you would spend or the cost for the delivery is internal because you're paying staff salaries. You are doing the procurement by paying the suppliers. You're setting up that supply chain, managing the warehouses. If you are working with the private sector or giving the cash to the beneficiaries, they are paying the private sector to do that delivery for us. And as a result, more of the funds get injected into the local host economy. And that will have multiplier effects because you're paying them to do the delivery. They're creating jobs. The money goes home with their employees and their employees can buy things. And the, the whole system multiplies that money. So your local economic benefits are more with cash. <clears throat> the result of this is ultimately how you're delivering a project contributes to the achievement of a program's objectives. So if the program's objective is to support the local economy, in addition to feeding refugees or giving blankets to refugees in this case. Um, and your secondary objective is to support the local economy. Um, by using cash and injecting more money into the local economy, um, through that delivery process, you're achieving that objective. Ultimately, this means that how you are delivering is intrinsically linked with the program outcomes. So no longer we can't make decisions on how we're going to deliver in a bubble. We can't decide which suppliers we're going to use or how we're going to set up a supply chain anymore alone because it affects achievement of those project objectives. So what does this do for that diagram we had before? Well, this means that before you can decide on which process now, because it's going to affect the way, um, because it's going to affect the project outcomes, there has to be a decision which approach is going to be made. And before a decision can be made, you have to understand what the implications are. You have to do assessments, do analyses, weigh the options, look at it all. And where supply chain used to get involved really at the point of starting procurement, um, now supply chain really has to get involved in the analysis, in the assessments, weighing those options and providing insight to help make those decisions. What's interesting, I'm gonna go back up here for a moment. Look at this. All of those icons that are blue, 
they all, they're all new and different for operations staff. These are not activities that we're used to doing. And all this analysis, all the assessments and the weighing of options, this is, this is very different from the skills that we as supply chain folk are used to having to do. We're used to running a procurement process, managing a warehouse, planning a transport schedule, <clears throat> very distinct action-oriented tasks. And now all of a sudden, they're adding, cash is requiring that we do a lot more in terms of analytical skills, weighing of options, predicting of outcomes, understanding the differences and the choices. That's gonna be a huge, huge difference for supply chain staff and what we need to learn and understand um, and be able to do and what might be required of us. What's also interesting about this graph is if you look up here, these items up there at top require a lot more physical investment. Your supply chain, if you have to deliver food throughout Sudan, you might have a network of warehouses that you've contracted and invested in and rub halls in very, very far reaches of small um, states and provinces throughout the countryside. If you shift towards cash, that asset base changes significantly. You no longer have to invest in those warehouses. However, what happens if something happens to the market? You might have to switch back and forth. You might have to be ready to understand or tell your management how quickly you, it would, or how much time it would require to make a switch to rebuild that full physical supply chain. There are some reports that even say that supply chain or operations, um, the supply chain operations can be as much as 60% of a humanitarian organization's budget. And as a result, if you're outsourcing a large portion of this, you're changing the overall financial structure of the organization. It's gonna significantly affect that asset base, the resource requirements for the organization. So these sort of concerns are going to really drive the skill sets and the requirements, the thinking needed um, for supply chain staff. Um, hi, Rebecca, I see your point about um, supply, uh, supply chain getting involved in assessments. And yes and no, I would say some organizations have always had supply chain involved, but many also have not. Um, it's absolutely critical now that supply chain is because if you're going to outsource to the private sector, you have to be very sure that the private sector has the capacity to deliver on your behalf. So it's critical that supply chain be involved. There are still circumstances, however, that where when talking to people who are in supply chain, where you ask them, you know, what has your involvement been in cash up to now? And they say, well, cash, cash is really more of a program thing. We don't understand why we would be involved or you're outsourcing your supply chain, you won't need us. And that's not true. 
you really need them actually even more because now you are increasing potentially your risk exposure by not having that supply chain under your control. Um, I'm glad to hear that in your experience, everybody hasn't been involving supply chain, but that has not, in my experience, been the case when I've been talking to um, supply chain. So continuing on, what are the implications here? You might be handling movement of large volumes of cash now. You might be involved in contracting of traders, contracting of service providers. You might be asked to explain the difference in the contracting process what, and advise on how to approach contracting service providers. Um, you'll have to start ensuring that beneficiary data protection clauses are included in your um, scopes of work, in your contracting or tender documents, in um, the contracts themselves. Make sure that your suppliers are disposing of data. You may be more involved in assessing the supply chain of the market, um, particularly retail supply chains with physical goods. Um, you have maybe asked to do a lot more monitoring, especially of retail outlets, et cetera. So if you take each of those mechanisms, each of those mechanisms are going to have different implications. So for example, if you take, so if you take direct cash, which is a cash, um, which is your cash in envelopes, so checks and money orders, what might be the implications? And these are the exact implications that we had up before. You might want to think about or if you've identified a whole bunch of different potential implications of using cash, think about which ones apply for each mechanism. So contracting of a service provider prob probably wouldn't be as applicable for this one because if you're doing cash in envelopes, you won't be using, say, a mobile money service. Indy Rock, get out from under the desk. I'm really sorry to interrupt the webinar because of a mischievous puppy. I, I, yes, now you're gonna try and lick me. Thank you. Okay. Um, you have to think through the mechanisms and think about these implications. So cash and envelopes, you, that first one of handling a large volume of cash and dealing with the you might be contracting a secure cash transporter or an armored truck. Um, you might be working with your security officers and your admin officers to know that the re appropriate protocols are in place uh, for handling the cash. Um, and so you'll need to look at sort of every aspect of the delivery process and think about how with that mechanism, how might your activities or your role might be affected? So that brings us through our sort of brief introduction to cash. And I've also been asked to give you some options on where you can learn more. There are two um, courses that I'd like to talk about now that are open um, to the general um, public to available to everyone. The first is the core cash transfer programming skills for supply chain finance and ICT staff. That is um, a Calc course. 
and the Humanitarian Logistics Certification Program. So first, the, the first one, um, the core cash transfer programming skills for supply chain finance and ICT staff is a course that was jointly developed by CALP and Fritz Institute. It is part of CALP's overall learning pathway. What they want you to do is look at what you have to do as an individual, <clears throat> take some introductions, <clears throat> the fundamentals, the introduction to marketing analysis, and then think about what core skills you might require, what's most appropriate for you. Um, there are three major core courses for CALP. One is for managers, one is for program staff, and the other is for supply chain finance and ICT staff. Um, we have a question or comment from David quickly. So it looks like cash is more technology driven than usual humanitarian operations. Isn't it going to be a challenge to have the infrastructure in place? I see data protection as key. Um, data protection is absolutely key. And there's also any experience of donor acceptance replacing aid goods with cash. Um, there is, so starting with David, there is definitely a huge push and concern around the technology platforms. Um, the reason this last course, Supply Chain Finance and ICT, is delivered together is for all those staff members is because of the real integrated nature of the work. Um, you have to work very, very, very closely with finance and ICT um, as supply chain staff to effectively deliver. Everybody has different expertise that they are bringing to the table. The procurement or supply chain person will understand how to run the procurement process, including how to negotiate with suppliers to really make sure that the services you're acquiring meet the requirements of the project. The finance person has the expertise to really look at the potential suppliers' um, financial statements and look for risk. What is the risk associated with using the different types of suppliers? And the ICT person is essential because they're the ones that understand the data security around platforms. They can look at, is that mechanism, is the mobile money secure enough for um, the data of the program. And you have to really work together and understand each other's perspectives, expertise, what you bring to the table in order to effectively deliver the projects. So each of those courses try to target different staff and different competences required. Um, the program and this, we'll call the last one, the operations staff, the supply chain finance ICT, um, those are both five-day courses if done face-to-face, -face, and CALP is currently rolling them out um, worldwide. To answer the second question, Maggie's, about experience of donor acceptance replacing goods with cash, absolutely, and Anais, already um, answered this somewhat. Um, yes, absolutely. In fact, now they're often, uh, the donors are often asking why not cash? Sergey is asking, 
um, if there's going to be a two world situation where some suppliers can cope with e-trading and some cannot. Based on the quality of the product or delivery, I don't know if it's a two world situation. Um, I think that one can be open for debate. Sergey, I'm going to ask if we can hold that question for the end. So CALP has this learning pathways. And then after you go through a core course, you can practice your skills with different activities. The course that we're talking about or sharing with you here is the last of the three core courses, supply chain finance and ICT. It was, Fritz Institute really led the authorship of this course um, with the financial support and backing of USAID. And under the guidance of a task force that included all of these organizations, um, they contributed both subject matter experts, um, materials for the course, and really dug into the materials for the course as they were written, um, making sure that every single part of it is the most common and um, wherever possible best approach for operations people to be taking. That course's objectives really focus on building understanding. And so a lot of the topics that we touched on here today are dug into a lot more deeply. So who does what at every single step in the project cycle. The course also tries to support as much as possible um, building of skills, building of looking at some of the essentials that everyone needs to understand how to do. Um, it can't solve everything in five days, but it does try to establish some basics. And the third component, the third objective is to build synergies and really talk to operations staff about how to talk with your program counterparts, how to talk with management, what they would be concerned about and how do you share what your concerns are? How do you talk within operations between supply chain finance ICT? Understanding what everybody brings to the table and really being able to help it all work together more seamlessly. The Humanitarian Logistics Certification Program um, is the second of the two course areas. Um, the certification program is actually made up of three different courses. Um, CHL, Certification in Humanitarian Logistics, CHSCM, Supply Chain Management, MedLog, Medical Logistics Practices. And of these three courses, the first two were updated last year for cash. Um, has anybody in this group taken any of these courses? Yeah? Oh, great. Um, these courses after Fritz Institute um, developed the core skills for operations staff in conjunction with CALP, they took the content of that course and used that to update the humanitarian logistics certification program. Um, so the content and the insight and expertise of that entire task force was really also leveraged to update these courses. The CHL course specifically is seven modules, seven quite long modules. And you can see number six it is now entirely devoted to cash transfer programming. Um, 
prior to this update, there was a module on import export and the content of import export has now been integrated into some of the other modules. Um, the reason I bring up these modules here so that people are aware that you can actually take modules individually. And that is not very well known fact, but you can actually just take warehousing and inventory if you want to, or just cash transfer programming. You won't get the same level of certification. You won't, your skills won't be certified the way they are with the full CHL course, but um, it is a useful thing to know if you want something that is very, that is more topic specific and streamlined. Um, you can go to the website, um, humanitarianhlcertification.org, I think. There we go. There's your website. Um, and you can also email the organizers there, uh, Rebecca. So those are the two courses that we were going to bring up. And now, and we're just about right on time. So now we're gonna open it up to question and answer about um, the CALP course is on the CALP website. Um, cashlearning.org, I believe their website is. And I also need to find a link for that ODI report for you from earlier, because we had a question about that. Did anybody else have any other questions? Um, and we can pass, pass, didn't show what has been replaced in CHSCM. <clears throat> That's from David. Um, well, David didn't, we didn't, CHSCM doesn't have, units quite the same structure as CHL. Um, it does have, it was reorganized though. Um, I'm trying to actually remember. It was really sort of integrated. And I can tell you that the major project in the middle of the um, in the middle of the course was replaced with a, a potential scenario of modality switching and the impact to the overall supply chain. Um, And we do have, thank you, uh, Nicola, um, who is posing as George Fenton right now, um, for reminding me of Sergey's question earlier and examples of donors push for cash activities. Um, that second one, the examples that I give you it's, it's really more relevant per organization. I don't really have, um, I think, appropriate examples. It is important to note that the donors do sometimes push for one modality over another. And the decisions between modalities are often made for reasons that are not um, analysis driven. What's really important as supply chain folk is that we still, that we don't not do the analysis, that we have to still do the analysis and make sure that decisions are documented so that to, for audit purposes. And so show that you did the analysis on the import parity price calculation, for example, um, 
but that the decision on a project level was taken because of donor preferences. And document that, have that written down um, in case it ever comes back to ask. Um, we do know, yes, who signs the grand bargain, of course, but the grand bargain doesn't say or decide to do cash. What it does is make sure that cash is considered and considered equally, at least. Um, regarding Sergey's question, about some suppliers able to cape with, cope with e-trading and others not. Um, are, are you talking on a platform basis on people being able to protect data or are you talking on, let's, Sergey, can I give you the mic so you, Would that work? Uh, do you yeah, hear me there. now? Okay, we can hear Sergey. Wonderful. Okay, so my question is, uh, there are some suppliers who won't be able to accept electronic payments or making cash transfers because they don't have the, the technology for it. So uh, I'm afraid that when it will come to uh, analyze criteria, decide which supplier to choose. We will choose the one who can uh, go with electronic payment even if it's not the best in terms of uh, delivery delays, quality of products, etc. So how can we go around this thing and make sure that ev everybody, all the suppliers are treated equally? Um, okay. Thank you for clarifying your question. This would be the same as any other procurement process in the sense that the suppliers have the opportunity to develop technology. Today. Um, to bring technologies in and work on them. Um, you have to work very closely with your program staff to define what it is they need to achieve and make sure that they're not defining criteria for the purposes of, you know, defining what their end goals are as opposed to criteria for criteria's sake. So their goal is they want to transfer money securely to a beneficiary. Okay. And not necessarily their goal being to use mobile money. Yes, but uh, imagine that um, the, the program says each family should have uh, 20 sales per month so for, the, for the, the quarter, blah, 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 and you give money on a credit card for the family to go and buy those soaps and make it simple. Yeah. So they have to go to a shop who is capable of selling them those soaps and accepting uh, electronic payment. Yep. And you have to do the assessments ahead of time to make sure that there are sufficient shops accepting the potential payment technologies okay. um, at so, the correct and that they're providing goods at the correct quality. Yeah, so my dilemma is if I find two suppliers, one has very good product but cannot accept payment and the other has a lesser good product accepting e-payment, then I will be almost forced to choose the ones that has uh, worse products because he's accepting e-payment, which means that the payment uh, capabilities of the supplier is becoming a major criteria when you analyze the different offers. And this yep. is, wasn't which like is, that before. Which is what, what I meant about documenting the decisions. It's if, if the donor or somebody is pushing for using e-cash, and you know, requiring to you to use eCash even for your project, that these sort of circumstances have to be noted for audit purposes and, and say, okay, you're requiring that. 
but that means that it's going to only be with the supplier of lesser quality soap. And so you raise these concerns and then and make sure that they're noted. And then it's up to management to make the decision as they choose, as long as they are informed. Do you think there is a possibility that the donors of major aid agencies like the UN ones would uh, invest into bringing up to speed private suppliers by providing technology, equipment, and so on? Um, and it certainly happens in projects, yes. But what you need to make sure to know <clears throat> note is that those suppliers are now beneficiaries of your project. Right. Um, so I hope that helps. I'm going to turn your mic off because we also have a couple other questions coming up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Anais, in fact, it seems now that they're pushing to use cash as a default. Just as much as we need to um, we're pushing to use cash as a default to do activities We can continue to use paper vouchers or manual cash. What about equipping the suppliers ourselves? Um, Maggie, yes, I'll try to get back to your point about donor funding. Just as much as one has to justify using cash, you have to justify using in kind. You should be looking at all modalities equally. Um, presenting the advantages and disadvantages and making sure people have all the information available. Um, it is not our place as supply chain or operations staff to make those decisions, but to our job is to present management and our program counterparts with the benefits and disadvantages of each option and help them make the decision and make sure it is documented. I hope that helps. Um, Maggie had a question. As I recall in the Philippines, the cash scheme was stymied for need of repairs to a bridge to let suppliers truck in the goods and the EU would not fund the repair. So we may need to think outside the conventional funding box. Absolutely. Um, and if the local market can't get around that bridge, your choices are left as go with an in-kind option or fix the bridge. Um, find other ways to fix the bridge. Absolutely. Maggie, I don't know if that really helped your question. Can I give you voice and you can let me know? I've offered Maggie the microphone. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. No, my point was that when you, you've got, say, one big donor funding a very large program and then they come back to you and you've got a scheme that's all set up and ready to go except you need to spend a few thousand dollars repairing a bridge and they say well we can't do that because 
bridge repair doesn't come under funding stream xyz mm -hmm. the donors in my view need to be more flexible and that means really trying to educate them yes the cash schemes or and and equivalent are opening up whole new areas where they need to stop thinking in terms of tents and blankets and start having a more wide-ranging approach to funding now how we do that is a whole other issue but obviously it's something that absolutely affects us as as logisticians and, and supply chain managers and it needs, needs to be to be raised absolutely and the best thing we can do is talk about this and raise awareness on it the sort of thing the HLA was set up for. Exactly. Um, thank you for sharing. My pleasure. Does anybody else have any additional questions at this point? Um, Sergey's question, isn't it also dis a point from Lena saying, isn't it also disrupting local markets, organizations choosing which suppliers would receive the cash? Um, Lena, absolutely. And that's where um, it is also um, no longer competitive procurement if you're choosing the suppliers. Um, for the purposes of you want to target certain suppliers. Those suppliers are no longer suppliers. They're now beneficiaries of the project and need to be treated as such and documented as such. And as supply chain folk, we have to make sure when program staff start talking in that fashion that they understand what they are implying. And when they are crossing the lines of um, hurting competitive procurement or stopping competitive procurement and becoming beneficiaries. Um, from LKKK, the biggest challenge has been to engage informal service providers in money transfer programs where there are underdeveloped banking institutions like Somalia, Syria. Um, there is a program or a project called Remote Cash, which talks a lot about this also, about scenarios where it's too dangerous for humanitarians to enter, the pro enter a certain geographical region, such as Somalia and um, where you might still be using cash. That project, um, it's from the Norwegian Refugee Council. Again, it's called remote cash, like remote control. Um, has some really valuable information on how to handle those scenarios. Could be useful for you to look into. And thank you for bringing that up, Bill KKK. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, where can we find the recording of this session? Um, Nicola, who's signed on under George Fenton's name, will send it to everyone. Absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> all right, apparently Nicola is not signed in under George Fenton's name, and I am confused. So, ah, two Nicolas, okay.
There we go. That solves that one. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Because if you Google remote cache NRC, it will pop right up. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, our time is up. You're always welcome to send an email. If you have more questions. E-course is chargeable. Um, the courses that we shared earlier um, are not e-learning. Um, the humanitarian logistics certification program is distance learning. There's a difference. Um, and they do have course fees. CALP, from my understanding, is not currently charging fees for their courses. Absolutely, no problem. All right, well, I wish everybody a lovely day lovely evening, wherever you are. And thank you for joining us today. <laughs>